I'm Mark Dawson from The Self-Publishing Show, and this is Self-Publishing Spotlight, where we shine a light on the indie authors who are changing the world of publishing one book at a time. Hello, and welcome to The Self-Publishing Spotlight. We meet indie authors at all stages of their careers and ask them a series of five questions, five questions about their process, their mistakes, and their successes, five answers that will help you level up your own author career. My name's Tom Ashford, and I'm part of the self-publishing formula. Don't forget that you can get your self-publishing resource kit at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash starter kit. This week's guest is John Evans. He's written four books in the fantasy and sci-fi genres, and he lives in Cardiff, Wales. Welcome, John. Hi, thanks very much for having me on. How are you doing? I'm I'm not too bad, thanks. It's, um, it's unbearably hot for me, but other than yeah. that, I think I'm going okay. I'm, I live in the uh, third floor of a... Uh, terraced building uh converted attic and i am dripping with sweat already and it's not even summer yet so <laughs> things aren't looking good for this year <laughs> yeah we have excellent insulation in modern buildings but no air conditioning because it's the uk so. yeah great great winters <laughs> awful awful summers all right well uh yeah welcome to the uh self-publishing spotlight uh guest number two it's very exciting uh, let's start off with the first question, which last week I described as an easy question, but I probably should have said was an incredibly difficult question to answer, which is, why do you write? Why do I write? Oh, yeah, that, that actually is quite difficult. I think when I was, when I was a child, there were, um, there, there were a few careers that I, I considered when I was a, a little bit older, and, and you get to the point where you're, the things that you think about are serious. Um, and uh, and I was put off or let myself be put off all of them. But I think I, I always thought being a writer would be would be good for me. The problem was that when I was when I was young, you were you were really only looking at the traditionally published route. There wasn't a realistic chance of um, of any kind of self publishing. Um, so when I got to about the university age, I, I went off a little bit late and I went off, went off in 97. Um, that was when I first got a copy of the Writers and Artists Yearbook, which was a big sort of digest manual of all the publishers and all the agents and how do you submit to them. And um, uh, well, well, basically you submit to them, you take a submissive role and, and give them exactly what they want. And if you don't give them exactly what they want, um, then then they're not ever going to accept your manuscript, let alone read it. So so that included at the time for anybody who doesn't know, you, you would you would write off because there was no um, public access to the internet. You would write off and, and get sent um, guidelines as to what what sort of content they wanted and how your manuscript would be formatted. Um, and that put me off even finishing any of the many stories I've worked on. Um, I'd, I've been writing a lot of stories in one form or another because I've been role playing since I was about eight years old. So it, that's that's extremely creative. And if, if you play for a while, sooner or later, you want to run a game of your own and then you want to create games. And even if they're in somebody else's world, you, you, you probably end up wanting to get quite detailed. So um it, it, it wasn't until very late in the game about 2016 that um that i realized that publishing direct to kindle was now not only possible but but all the processes were, were done by that point pretty well established so it was like doing anything that you can google a task on um and, and just go through it even if it's a bit laborious um, so yeah, I, I probably lost a good ten years where I could have been, um, I could have been writing and, and getting ready to publish because Kindle wasn't even the first e-reader. So mm. it should have been fairly obvious to someone like me that that there was this possibility that I could be a writer on my own. Um, mm. But yeah, I I had a history of letting myself get off, get put off too easily from things I thought might be appealing. Um, but I'm there now. I yeah. 20 years to find a career so well yeah i mean so you're uh you're tr um self-published as opposed to obviously traditional published or, or hybrid yes. no i'm i'm, I'm self-published i don't have any traditional contracts and 
I think it would require something like a diamond pony or something for me to actually want one. Yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, even, I'm not even vaguely curious about, about the idea. Um, I suppose if if somebody did an Andy Weir on me and said, hey, look, we'll give you stacks of cash and a film deal, I might say, okay, but, I, you know, it, it's, not a, it's not a realistic thing for me. And I've certainly no interest in pursuing it myself. So. Yeah, it's fair enough. So the second question is, how do you write, which is probably a bit more straightforward to answer. Are you uh, like a plotter or a pantser, as they say? I am an avowed plotter and a vehement proponent of plotting. Um, I think it's fine for people to be pantsers, but on all the thousands of hours of podcasts I've listened to, I've rarely heard somebody say, I used to be a plotter, um, but then I tried pantsing and it revolutionized my productivity, the complexity and quality of my stories and um, and and how I felt about myself as a writer. And what I usually hear is, I tried plotting, but I couldn't get on with it. Um, so after the first week, I gave up. Um, that's, that's, you know, I, I, there are certain things I'm going to recommend you to do if you, if you say, I want to do X, Y, and Z that I, that I know about. If you said you wanted to, you wanted to do archery, I wouldn't recommend you go and do it in your back garden. Theoretically, you can. I'd say go and do a course at a club because that's safe <laughs> and, that, yeah. and that's known to work. Um, for writing, if, if somebody were to say say to me, which should I choose? I would say, well, plotting is a reliable method. There are many books about it, and it's it's a way to help you understand a story structure um, and preemptively find the holes in the story that you might otherwise find quite frustrating if you um, if you write through. I think pantsing works for a a relatively small number of people. Um, and, and I also tend to think I also I have a sneaking suspicion that if I could force them to answer questions honestly on a large enough scale, I could demonstrate that pantsers have really good memories. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. That they they haven't written down a plot, but what they don't necessarily what they it would be feasible that they wouldn't necessarily understand that the reason that they think it's weird that the rest of us do is because their memory is good enough that they can hold, they've already got the plot in their head. They've got their bullet points. They're just in their head. Yeah. So they think they're, you know, they, they, they don't realize how much they're holding it in their head. And after all, a, a plot is only a series of, of bullet points. You can certainly write lots and lots and lots on, you know, in addition to that, but it's, you know, when's the inciting incident? What, what, what is that incident? What brings them out of their, out of their ordinary world into, into the plot proper and, and, and act two um, and, and that sort of thing. You can you can make it as detailed or as or as light as you like. But um, yeah, yeah, it's fair enough. I, re- I did read something recently about uh, George R. R. Martin. Um, just want, just because as time of recording, the uh, Game of Thrones has just finished on TV, yeah. and he sort of uh, announced that he was a. Uh, he described himself as more of a gardener than an architect, which is quite a yes. nice way of saying, you know, pantser rather than plotter. But you do kind of wish that he'd be more of a plotter, given the um, uh, the rate of his books coming I, out. Yeah, I I suspect that if he if he was a if he was more of a plotter, he would have had an easier time writing to, to the complexity that he wants to. For instance, I know that he famously uses an old PC and a um, piece of software called WordStar 1512. That was something I got on my first PC. There was a hand-me-down from my dad's business, and it it was it was use tabs and cursor keys to move around the screen, and it was it was monochrome. Well, technically it was two colors, but it was you know one flat color and another flat color. It wasn't eight and sixteen colors or anything because PCs were awful at that time. Uh, this thing had like a 20 meg hard drive so he's writing on a piece of software that's that's older than a lot of the authors who are alive today um but he does that quite deliberately yeah um, personally i would never recommend doing that just like i wouldn't recommend writing in word um i don't actually think it's a it's, it's an advisable idea but you can do it um but yeah i mean he's he's got an incredibly complicated plot I imagine if you go to his writing hole, he's got huge amounts of paper notes or something, or like 
physical charts or whiteboards or, or, or we must have some way of sort of trying to keep track of all that um, and it, it, it sounds awful I wrote massive documents on WordStar um, that, that you know tens and tens of thousands of words of, of role playing characters um, and yeah I, I, I couldn't honestly recommend it to anybody who lives in an age where it's not not your only option <laughs> yeah fair enough Okay, well, question number three. Are you a full-time author? If you are, how did you get there? And if you aren't, what steps are you taking to make it happen, presuming that you do want it to happen, if you're not? Uh, yes, yes. I, um, so I'm, I'm fortunate in a way. I, I don't, I'm, I'm single. I don't have a family to support or, or any dependents of any kind. Um, so my, my requirements um, you know, financially are, are much lower than average. Um, but I was writing while I had a part-time job um, until last year, um, and now writing needs to be my my full-time job. I, I still do a bit of volunteering, um, but I'm I'm trying to cut that back because you know I, I I just don't have time. It's not it's not effective use of of my time um, to to do that at the moment. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm effectively full-time, but I wouldn't want anybody to go away with the impression that I'm I'm one of the full time people who's who's earning a um, small fortune. Yeah, yeah. I'm not even earning I'm not even earning a a a, a proper livable wage. Really, I'm just eking by, and uh, and you know we've had a couple of recent sales, and that's that's helping us get back up there. Um, but I just need to hammer through the next books, um, preferably before Edinburgh this year. So. Cool. Uh, is there anything that you particularly did to, you know, make that happen, or is it just, you know, getting the sales? Well, um, so the first book I published was in was in twenty seventeen, and um, that was uh, I I had this pet project. I wanted to write an epic fantasy, and I saw um, Garrett Robinson, who who um, used to work with the Sterling and Stone guys, but he he's, he's got a large fantasy series. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it was him who, who said that he, he had an epic fantasy series he wanted to write, but in the end he decided to write shorter books in the same world to, to let him create that world first um, and, and to practice his, his writing and get to the point where he thought that the epic project was something he could tackle. So I thought, that's great. I'm going to do a series about a city watchman so i basically decided that i was going to have my epic fantasy world which is sort of high fantasy with 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 magic and so on um not grimdark but i was going to i was going to do the genius thing of trying to combine that with, with uh detective mysteries and have them solving crimes and you get to find out about the city that's, that's the main city in the in the world and, and all, all that sort of thing Detective fantasy is not a genre. <laughs> Urban fantasy is almost, you know, it's very often about detectives of some kind. There's, there's some kind of person who investigates things. Um, that is absolutely common. But other than Terry Pratchett and a couple of other people, when we talk about crime and fantasy, it's thieves and assassins in a fantasy setting. But thieves and assassins who, who tend to be basically good guys. Yeah. You know, which I'm, I'm, I'm fine with. I love the thief and assassin books, but the point is that it's not, it's not a commercially viable subgenre at the moment. So unless of the people listening to the podcast to, to, to this, you know, suddenly four or five of them think, oh, I'd love to write about a, uh, an epic fantasy policeman and his mates solving crimes. Um, you know, it's never going to be a, a subgenre in which you can market books. So after that, my brother had been writing um, an epic fantasy series, and he got quite a long way through it uh, without even telling anybody that he was that he was even writing. That was his private project, and and he, he finally told me. Um, and he he wasn't, from my perspective, I was worried that he would just sit on this thing and keep beetling away at it and never actually do anything with it. So. I convinced him to go to 20 Books London in in February 2018, um, and 
because I was I was going to go, um, but I convinced him it would be worth him spending spending his weekend there, um, and we we went along, and at that point he was able to see this isn't my my considerably younger brother who's got considerably less grey hair. Um, it wasn't it wasn't him just saying oh yeah this is a, this is a great way you can make money. Um, it's it's actually a real thing. You really can self publish at a relatively low cost and get your books out there um, and with perseverance and listening to um, you know listening to good advice you, you can make a living so his books were still a massive task and he'd written the first couple um, and in the in the run-up to 20 books London um, I suggested to him that maybe we should write something together since we were both writing fantasy if we wrote science fiction which we you know we both love i love science fiction and fantasy partly because james is three years older than me and, and also loves science fiction and fantasy so i've got to read all of the books that he bought or you know or either of us got bought for birthdays and and, and so on um so we we thought we'll write science fiction together that's that's different to what we're writing um, and we went with military science fiction, sorry, Chris Fox. Um, and uh, so we, we decided to write about some, some Royal Marines in a, in a future that we, we created specifically so that there could still be individual countries. Not a future we think will actually happen. I, I, I suspect there'll be a world government where by the time we're settling um, other solar systems. But, but the point is you, you, you want something to base your stories around. So we went with something that could, could be commercially viable um, and could also be short enough that, that that we could that we could start getting books out with reasonable ease. We didn't want to do. Um, I'd love to write some epic sci-fi, but it's not you know it's not where we needed to be. So that's that's what we did, and and that is how we achieved um, that's how we achieved good enough success that I'm only slightly sweating about money all the time. Um, James is fine. He's got a he's, he's got a proper job, but um, but, but um, it'll it'll be a few months before before we're completely back on track. Um, and we used we used uh, pre made covers, um, and they were great. Um, and then by the time we got the first three books out, Podium contacted us and said, "Would you like to do audio?" So we got audio done with with Podium um, for the first for the first four books. Um, we recovered the books with more on-point military sci-fi covers, um, and we've also now moved them onto a company account. So, so that's that's basically it. That's that's what we did. We we followed all the advice from Mark Dawson um, and Twenty Books and Chris Fox and Joanna Penn and so on, um, as as well as we could. Um, not perfectly by any means, but but that's where we're getting our information um, and. And we approached it in a in a calm, rational manner to try and create something that, that has potential to sell, um, and and it, and it should be going very well later this year when we've got a couple more books out. We've got a whole raft of other books that are just getting there to be ready to be published. But when, once that happens, I, I expect to see um, see good things happen for us. So cool, that's great. Uh, and well sort of connecting into that one uh question number four is what mistakes do you think you've made um anything that you'd warn people about uh yes it's great to go to uh conferences but spend more time writing and less time agreeing to go to um to all of the conferences which which i have done i've done london i did vegas I did 20 books Bali, which was fantastic. And my first opportunity to go to Asia, but, but I really should have been writing more books instead. Right. Um, and I'm going to Edinburgh and I'm going back to, to Vegas. So, um, it'll be, it'll be a few months, even if I, even if my current rate of productivity continues, um, before, before I can demonstrate that all that was sound financial investment. Um, it wasn't sound financial. It's only sound financial investment if it if it pans out fairly soon. Otherwise, it was a foolish risk. But fun. <laughs> um, yes. Try try one a year. Yeah. <laughs> and preferably the one that's closest. Yeah. Um, but 
it's I, I still heartily recommend conferences, but 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 be better, be smarter about it than, than I was, um, and try and keep up your production rate above above almost all other considerations. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, well, the final question, question number five is, what's your final piece of advice for authors starting out in indie publishing? Other than don't um, go to every conference you can possibly find. Yeah, I mean, if you're a stockbroker, just go to every con- conference. It, it, it's, you know, financially, it doesn't matter. It's it, that, that is one of the most important things. It's, it's all about what you can afford. Mm. I'm a massive fan of bootstrapping. Um, our first covers were cost effective. They were, um, they made us... Up. A, a lot of money per book, for, you know, um, with, with covers that um, that we wanted to get get to be more on point now. And I think the new covers are successful. But while we were changing things over and re-editing books and and so on, and to make sure that they were perfect for um, for Podium when they wanted to record them, um, we, we we lost momentum on getting new books out, and and, and that that financially cost us um in in reality we would probably have been better off waiting until we got a couple more books out and then hoping podium were, were still interested and having a stronger series before um before we worried about changing covers and, and so on and so forth um but uh, it's it's, it's mostly about sticking to sticking to sensible things. You should you should listen to podcasts and watch the YouTube channels. I've already mentioned um, all the important ones. But as soon as you found if you found this podcast already, you should be able to find all of the others. Um, and I would also advise that um, because I am because I'm single and I don't have kids to look after. I have listened to all of the podcasts, and I mean, you know, like the entire backlist of of Joanna Penn and so on, and and, and the Sterling and Stone guys and, and all that sort of stuff. So I have I have listened to all of the advice many, many more times than I need to. Um, and it, if, if if you're completely new, I would try and restrict yourself to either specific topics that you need an answer to. Um, at, or, or at least the listening to the last six months, um, and then if you think, well, there's, I feel like I've got a hole in my knowledge. Go and look for that, for that gap. Um, and um, I would definitely, re- you know, I've I've got both of Mars courses, and they're a fantastic way to to boil everything down to two courses rather than spending an awful lot of hours listening to hundreds and hundreds of podcasts. I've got like 26 podcasts on my phone. Okay. So, um, plus half a dozen YouTube channels that I, that I watch every video of. Um, so I'll, 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 it's, it's good, but I wouldn't recommend it. I think you're better off doing, you know, doing Mark's courses or, um, or, um, starting with some of the simple books and, and cherry picking the podcasts and, and YouTube channels. Cool. Good advice. And uh, that's it. That's your five questions. You're off the hook. Great. Cool. Okay. Well, um, I, I hope that was helpful to somebody. And I'm sorry that I, I'm always long winded. So, yeah. No, it's perfect. That's great. Well, thank you for coming on, John. All right. Welcome. Cool. Uh, That's it for this week's self-publishing spotlight. Don't forget that you can get your free self-publishing resource kit at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash starter kit. And if you want to appear as a guest on this show, send us brief details about yourself and your writing to support at selfpublishingformula.com using the subject line self-publishing spotlight. I'm Tom Ashford and I'll see you again next week. 